I'm going to go into uh, the, the ideas of uh, Fallon and Elliot Jacks, and we'll get into that. Um, but the, the, the focus is going to be on time and how it relates to your experience of context. Elliot Jacks is an uh, organizational psychologist with a lot of very influential ideas. Um, he came out of the uh, Canadian Armed Forces after World War II, and uh, he had been spending a lot of time there figuring out who was going to be promoted to uh, officers and who was going to stay at the enlisted person level. Uh, and he was looking at um, what it was about a person that, that was that thing that made them leadership material. So he had that mindset as he went uh, out into academia and uh, into the business world after World War II and started keeping in touch with the people that he had placed into these leadership roles and kept asking them, surveying them, uh, you know, how, what are you doing now? What are you being paid? How do you feel about it? And he discovered that the amount of money, there's this feeling of felt fair pay. People would say, I am doing a job that challenges me and I'm being paid uh, an amount of money that feels right to me. Or they would say, I'm doing a job that's super easy, but I'm being paid uh, as though I was doing a hard job. Or they would say, I'm doing a really hard job, but I'm being paid as though the job is really easy. So he discovered that he, he, was, he was curious about this and, and uh, uh, commissioned a lot of other surveys and discovered that the, uh, uh, the, the, the role that people felt that the, the pay matched up with had to do with the amount of time that uh, they were given to use their judgment to come up with a solution to a problem. So a longer time span uh, that was required of them to, pr to produce a, uh, a work product, the higher the pay was that felt fair. And uh, uh, so he decided to name this time span, the time span of discretion. Uh, and it, it became a, uh, a linchpin of his, of his uh, 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 research. And the time span of discretion is the time it takes to do the longest task for which you are responsible to complete using your own judgment. And this, uh, this, uh, this notion of the, the, the time it takes to do something is related very directly to that thing that he was looking for in those people that were, uh, he was going to recommend for promotion. And that was uh, eventually he discovered that, that uh, after a while of, uh, of, of trying to figure out what this was, he figured out that it was basically the level of cognition, the, the type of cognitive processing and the level of abstraction that this processing dealt with. And it was uh, the level of cognition required for the role, uh, the level of cognition of which one is capable, and the level of cognition which one exhibits when working. And these three do not have to match up. It's best if they do, and we'll talk about that, but they don't have to. And when you, they don't, you get into a lot of trouble, you get into a lot of dysfunction in hierarchical organizations. And a, uh, a rubric that he developed for uh, aligning these, the time span and the level of cognition is the stratum of work. It's a group of work roles with a similar time span of, of, of uh, discretion and a similar required level of cognition. Um, so we're going to see how all of these relate to each other. Um, I'm going to describe uh, the four lowest strata of work, the, the four work roles that uh, deal with the level of, of abstraction of verbal symbolic information. So we're going to begin with declarative processing. And the idea that, that uh, Jax uses to uh, exemplify declarative processing and these other types of processing is the style that you use when you argue. <laughs> and it seems interesting that we started out the day with uh, an entire discussion about argument. Um, and uh, John actually had a slide that described these are the components of an argument. And it, they're the components of a well-structured argument that someone may come up with at a fairly high level of cognition, but they're not, it's not the structure of every argument. In a declarative processing type argument, one says, I believe such and such a thing. 
And I believe it for this reason. And I also believe it for this other reason. And I could also give you this other reason. Uh, any one of those reasons is sufficient for me. Uh, you may find one or another of them resonates with you. So the, the, the concept of declarative processing is a very uh, deliberate, uh, chunked set of information, discrete reasons for things. And where this maps in a, in a, a, a work role is to a procedural type of role, uh, such as a manual uh, or a clerical worker, um, where there are concretely exampled outputs and specified methods for providing those outputs, for producing them. And the time span of discretion typically is one day to three months, where one person at a very high functioning level will be given a, uh, uh, a concretely exampled output to produce, and they are given up to three months to do it, and they are given their discretion in that time. Um, does any of this sound a little bit familiar as a tester? Uh, you have a specified uh, way of doing something. You have a, uh, a, 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 a describe, a, a, what did I say, a specified method and a concretely exampled output. You have a pass or a fail. Yeah, and this is basically describing the test case version of a tester. The reason I put this slide up here is uh, if you're having an argument and you have a picket sign and your neighbor has a different picket sign and their neighbor has a different picket sign, you're all being very declarative in what you want. I want this and I want it now and this is why I want it. And somebody else wants it the same thing and they want it for this reason and another person wants it for this reason. And all of you are declaring what you want. Uh, the uh, from the, the, the standpoint of being a tester, the feeling of a stratum one work role is I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to do it the way I was told to do it, and I'm going to produce an output. It's, it's, uh, uh, it, it, you're expected to get your work done in a day or a week or maybe a month or a couple months, but your discretion is, is fairly constrained uh, compared to other strata. In stratum two, one uses cumulative processing, where one says, okay, again, I've got this, uh, this goal that I want to achieve, or I've got this argument that I want to make, and I have a reason for this argument, but this particular reason is not sufficient in and of itself. I'm going to continue generating reasons until the cumul cumulative weight of these reasons uh, actually support this argument sufficiently, at least for me. So the role that would correspond to this type of processing is a diagnostic role, such as a doctor or a lawyer or a tester in our conception of testing, where one says, okay, I have uh, a, a, uh, a particular conclusion that I am expected to come to. You know, I've got a thing that I need to figure out. Um, I need to gather evidence. I need to weigh it all. Uh, I need to um, assess whether or not uh, you know, uh, the, the, whether or not the, the, the client should be uh, uh, defended according to this particular rule of jurisprudence or that particular law or this, um, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're constructing a defense of a, of a, of a client, you're going to, to construct it using uh, a, a preponderance of evidence and not just any one particular, particular uh, uh, idea. Or if you're, if you're being told as a tester, um, tell me whether or not such and such an, a, a, a feature is ready to ship, you're going to run a bunch of different tests and, and, and figure this out. The time span of discretion for this type of a role is usually three to 12 months. So uh, how long does it take to put together an adequate defense for uh, a, a client as a lawyer? How long does it take to um, uh, examine and run a bunch of diagnostic tests on a patient if you're a doctor. So the feeling is along the lines of this, where you have a list of symptoms, and you know, who, is, who here hasn't seen House, the famous whiteboard? Uh, they always list the symptoms and then they've got to cogitate and assess and figure it out. And uh, it doesn't usually take uh, three months, it usually takes under an hour, but uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the feeling is, is of this, where uh, the, the 
the, 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 the final answer is an interpreted thing rather than a, 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 a something that was specified ahead of time. Something that we're all familiar with as testers is the idea of a dashboard, and that's the same kind of feeling, okay? So I've got uh, this idea that um, this comes from uh, Eric Jacobson's blog, uh, uh, where he's, he's describing um, the results of the build process, okay? So the build of the particular module at the top uh, has passed all of its smoke tests, and so we can preliminarily at least give it a green smiley face. Um, uh, so we're, we're providing a, a, uh, uh, a, an evaluation of the, the evidence that we've been given, and preliminarily at least, giving it a, uh, a pass or a fail. Um, but it's always subject more to review. At Stratum 3, we're talking about serial processing, where we've got, again, we've got an argument or a, a point we want to make or a goal, and we want to construct a chain of arguments. And we can say, okay, uh, I'm going to, to arrive at this particular uh, endpoint by, by laying out an initial position, and then that's, if I, if I say this is the case, then the next bit is the case, and then the next bit leads on to the, the, the final conclusion that we've got. Um, at the same time, you can lay out another uh, uh, line of reasoning that arrives at the same conclusion. You can also lay out yet another line of reasoning, and uh, you may say, okay, well, this final line, uh, it may tend to lead off in another direction, but as long as we bring in the piece from the, the second line of reasoning that I already referred to, then everything will, uh, you, can, you can see where I'm going with this. Uh, we, uh, we all agree that uh, the, the final conclusion is, is the way things uh, uh, ought to go. That is a serial processing argument. You can hear it uh, when people talk and they say, um, well, to begin with, such and such a thing is the case. And then uh, uh, because that's the case, then the next thing happened. And then if that were to happen, then finally we'd achieve our goal. Uh, and so this, this corresponds to a managerial role where one is balancing the short and long-term goals or balancing the interests of competing uh, uh, priorities across multiple pathways in, in pursuit of a, a, a single final goal. And here, generally speaking, the time span of discretion is a year to two years. And the, the feeling here is along the lines of, of Lewis and Clark's uh, expedition where they're, they're moving, they've got a goal, okay, they need to get to the Pacific Ocean, they're, they've got a beginning point, and they have to make a lot of decisions along the way. Um, this particular map, I don't know how easy it is for you to see, but there are a ton of decision points, right? Every single one of the, uh, I wish I had a, a pointer, every, every, there are very tiny little lines of tributaries coming off of these rivers, um, or very, very, very long alternate routes that may or may not lead to a dead end. How do you figure out which way to go? They've always got to be thinking, how am I going to, to make all of these decisions to get to my final goal? And they, they used, does anybody know the name of the, the person that they acquired along the way to, uh, to help them make these decisions on a point-by-point on a -point basis? Yeah. Sacagawea, right. Sacagawea was operating at the stratum two level, saying, okay, now what I know about this, this uh, from what I know about the, the particular situation that we're in, you really ought to take the left fork versus the right fork. And Lewis and Clark would say, okay, given that and all the rest of the stuff that we know, we'll take the right fork. Um, and, you know, below, uh, uh, Sacagawea, there were all the, the people that were actually in charge of the procedures required to move everybody along on the expedition. They were the cooks and the bottle washers and whatnot. So you had Stratum 3 at Lewis and Clark, at Stratum 2 at Sacagawea and other guides, and Stratum 1 at the, at the people on the expedition. Um, from a, a software milieu kind of uh, experience that we're all very familiar with, you have a, the, the experience of managing a project. So uh, the project is moving along. It seems as though it's running late. Uh, you have to decide what course corrections to make in order to, to recover some buffer and, and meet your final goals. 
that's a stratum three role and usually that time span is, is a year to two years. At stratum four, we're using parallel processing to make our arguments where you've got a final uh, argument that you'd like to make and you say, okay, uh, I've got a variety of pathways that I can take to one supporting leg of an argument and I also have another variety of pathways that I can take to a second supporting argument. I have yet another series of pathways and oh, by the way, they also condition one another. And if you look closely, <laughs> some of these pathways might lead off somewhere else, but I believe the preponderance of evidence moves them all towards where I want us to go. Uh, that is uh, the, uh, the, the argument style. And the, the type of role is an orchestral role where one is doing general management and overseeing multiple projects. And uh, you're constructing and pursuing multiple uncertain paths all at the same time. The time span of discretion here is from two to five years. And the way that this feels, the, the, a, a cultural touch point, I guess, and back to the, the whiteboards and signs and, and things uh, theme is general management. This is uh, still from the, the film Moneyball, which is uh, Brad Pitt playing Billy Bean, who's the general manager of a baseball team, and he has to figure out how am I going to get enough offense and enough defense and enough pitching given my limited budget, uh, how am I going to stock my farm system, how am I going to prepare for future years of contracts, all of these different scenarios all happening at the same time in the context of 30 different teams who all want to poach him and, and uh, uh, take his players and, and all of that. Uh, so there's that's, uh, that, that sort of feeling of, of working through a, a lot of different problems at once. Um, this is a a, a PERT chart, which is a little bit more maybe something that you've seen uh, in your work. The idea is not to look at the PERT chart as a, a series of boxes that someone has laid out. It's to see it as the living document that it is. You see all the scribbles and the crossings out and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the emphasis lines. This is, a, this is the thought process of a person saying, I've got all these different demands. I have to draw from here and that's going to mean that, that something is going to get pushed and delayed. Uh, how am I going to juggle all this stuff? Well, I'm sorry, what is the name of that chart? This is a PERT chart. P-E-R-T. Mm -hmm. Good use of a red card. So uh, given that background, which I sort of whipped through, um, I'd like to discuss the idea of using this notion of, of work roles and time spans to get at what we do as testers. And I have a philosophical question. Where does context originate? I would love to just get any answers anybody wants. I have some ideas and I may rant for a bit because I have plenty of time. But I want to hear from you. Where does context originate? Experience? From whose experience? Uh, the tester's experience? A tester's experience. Anyone else? Good, good, good answer. Yes. The problem domain. The problem domain. Okay. The environment. Yes. The scale. The. Scale. Utilizing client. The client. Okay. Yes. So, uh, context is all of these things to the extent that we are able to experience and process them. Okay? Context originates from our interaction with all of these things. That's my claim. That's my argument. And that means that our context, our ability to express the, uh, the, the the situation that we find ourselves in and communicate with other people about what we're trying to do depends very strongly on the level of cognition we bring to the table, to the experience of what's happening. Because everyone experiences context differently. Isn't that right? Everyone brings their own biases, their own learnings, their own level of effort, and their own level of, 
uh, capacity to context. And so creating a shared context, creating a context model that everyone can work in productively, I'm going to argue, <laughs> uh, it depends on having a hierarchy of people with uh, more capacity directing the work of people with less. Now that doesn't mean that the people with less capacity are less valuable or are less persons or are less uh, interested in what they're doing. They simply have to have a smaller time span of discretion. So, practical questions. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm considering a lightning talk about the, the, the similarity between context and quality because quality comes from the exact same place that context does. What's the difference? What's the similarity? If anybody, I mean, I'd love some feedback on that idea. Maybe I'll just go do it. Um, so the practical questions, does my context encompass the task at hand? Does my boss's context encompass my own? How can I better match my team's abilities with their roles? These are the questions that the material that I've just offered you raises in your environment. So a task is going to have a particular time span over which it's, it, it, it needs to be done. Uh, it's, a, it's of a particular complexity. It requires a certain amount of, uh, of uh, uh, thought or uh, preparation or um, accumulation of evidence. The only way that we can approach a task in a way that actually does justice to the full extent of what the task represents is to have a context model that encompasses the full task. Where <laughs> th th this interacts with the second question, does my boss's context encompass my own? If I'm able to bring a larger context to a task than my boss does, okay, for whatever reason, I may happen to have a particular uh, skill set which my boss does not, or I may, uh, may have attended a really great conference that my boss didn't do, and therefore I know a lot more, um, then my interpretation of what the task means is going to be different than my boss's, and that's, uh, it's going to be bigger, it's going to be more interesting, more complex, actually more productive than what is originally intended, and it may be that my boss has to rein me in and say, dial it back, Jordy. <laughs> That's not what I'm going for, let me, let me rephrase. But if, if your boss does that enough, right, you can get by with that for a little bit, but if your boss does that enough, you're going to find that you feel very frustrated, you feel very locked in, you feel uh, as though your role is much smaller than your capacity. That's not a good place to be. Uh, so your brain disengages, right? If you feel as though you've got the freedom to explore the full meaning of the task within the context model that you bring to it, you have got the freedom to breathe into what you're doing. If you don't, if you're being told, okay, all right, those are our great ideas, but you know what? For right now, this week, just get this done. You stop breathing, okay? You stop engaging. You stop feeling as though you own this thing. And so if you're, if you're in charge of a team and you find yourself doing that to your team, stop, please, okay? Stop. Figure out who has what depth of context uh, when it comes to the particular tasks that you are expecting them to get done. You can have a discussion about what the actual time span of discretion for a particular task really should be. You know, it may be that, uh, but that there's a lot more uh, to be to be mined out of a particular task than you even imagined. Um, and if it turns out that somebody on your team consistently outthinks you, feel free to promote them. 
even if it's just informally. You'll get a much, much, much better work product out of them. Um, I am way ahead of time, so I'm going to flip over to another slide where I want to discuss the, uh, the, the, it's not exactly a technical formula, but it's a thought provoking formula for the, uh, the uh, applied level, the, the level of cognition which one brings to the task that I mentioned on my, on my initial slide as a function of the maximum level at which someone is capable of working and also the percentage of skills and knowledge which they uh, need for the role and also a percentage of their values and commitment to the role. So you, you are going to find that people who are insufficiently skilled for a particular task are going to bring a lower level of cognition and need a lower time span of discretion. So this is what we mean by bringing people up to speed. Okay, so someone comes into a new context and they, they have got the, the mental framework, they've got the ability, the raw horsepower in their head to get done what you need to get done, but they don't understand the business domain yet. They don't understand the tools that you're using. These are skills and knowledge problems. If, so they are expected to begin at a lower level. Um, the, uh, at, at some point, though, you have to actually feed them the, what they need in order to develop the skills and knowledge, and, and once you do that, then with any luck, you'll see their, uh, their, their level improve uh, or increase. The values and commitment is an incredibly important aspect. If you can't engage a person at the level of something that interests them, for instance, uh, if you have someone at uh, an organization where the organization really, really, really values programming skill, and this person does not care a bit about programming and just wants to test, you're going to have someone working at less than their maximum. Uh, so, I don't have a slide for this particular point that I'm going to make, so I'll just come back here. This is, this is what I think about the, uh, the idea uh, that, that John raised earlier uh, from, from Whitaker and, and others. Um, and that's that uh, their context, they, they, okay, let me go back here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The value portion of their equation here when it comes to testing is infinitesimal, okay? They can imagine it as something that requires a certain level of skill, but they don't care about it. Therefore, they imagine it as being something that requires a low level of cognition because that's all that they are willing to put into it themselves. And if all that's the only thing that you can imagine, if that's your context that you are bringing to the problem of testing, then you can't encompass a larger vision of a context for testing. And, that's, and, and you don't want to because your value and commitment to doing this is nil. Okay? You just, as far as you're concerned, it's a cost center. It doesn't matter. The less I think about it, the better. Therefore, the less anybody thinks about it, the better. And in fact, I can't imagine anybody thinking about it terribly much at all. Why not just get machines to do it? Or let's, why not get people with whom we can treat as machines to do it? So our, our school, our community is fighting, as, jo as James said, is fighting a battle for the for the recognition of the complexity of testing. Um, I believe that the, the most, sorry for all the clicks here, the most important transition that people make in their life is from stratum one to stratum two. Going from, it's the, it's the first one that you go through 
lot of people don't go through, by the way, a transition from stratum one to stratum two. Um, a lot of people, you know, over 50%, according to Jack's research over many, many, many years and thousands of corporations and whatnot, a lot of people simply stay at the declarative processing level in their life. The people who do, particularly people who come to it late in life, in their 30s and their 40s, experience what he coined the term midlife crisis. And the midlife crisis, people have got all sorts of, of uh, pop culture ideas of what a midlife crisis is about, but, but the guy who originally had the idea, Jax, calls it like this. It's looking around and seeing that all the decisions that you made from one point of evidence suddenly have actually got multiple points of evidence both for and against. You never even had the capacity to expand your context enough to see that there was another, another decision that you could have made. And so you are looking around at all the decisions that you've made in your life and saying, I could have done that different. I could have done that different. What was I thinking then? Oh my God. And it, uh, it, it tends to manifest itself as a, uh, a, a sort of a, a throwing away of some of the decisions that you've already made and trying to remake them in this, in this larger context brain that you've got. The next biggest transition is the transition into a higher actual order of abstraction, which is uh, stratum five, stratum six, stratum seven, stratum seven, which are declarative, cumulative, serial, and parallel processing of abstract conceptual information, which is basically groups of the sorts of things that you're processing in parallel with your verbal symbolic. So if you if you end up uh, noticing broad patterns in an industry and giving them names and blogging about them, you're probably operating at stratum five. Uh, if you're, if you're uh, uh, running a uh, business unit at a large corporation, you're probably uh, operating at stratum five. Um, it's the, uh, the, 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 the transition into the larger world of ideas more so than, than symbols of uh, things that you could probably point at if it actually existed. So uh, my, let me get back to my final slide. Okay, so my question for you all, and we will begin open season very early, is how much of a problem is this for you and how do you see yourself applying any of this? And obviously, open season can begin anytime. Thank oh, you very much. That's why the mic guy has just walked in from the prison. <laughs> so it's open season. Uh, I'll start this. Oh, good, John. Uh, wait, was there a gap? No. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to get me this fast. I can't hear the question. Sorry, no, I'm, I, I was just uh, going back to, um, you were describing how it required a, level, a higher level of cognition for, or like more, I think the term you used was higher capacity for somebody who was in a, like a, a role where there was, where they required a broader context, right? And I, I guess my question for you is that, or I guess a comment maybe, is that I wonder whether or not the, the roles themselves require information to be, repeat, be reported back at a higher rate at, and at a lower, at when you're closer to the ground. Like, if you're, like, you're, like the parallel processing orchestral role, that person is like setting like a, a, like a lar lar large scale roadmap for a project, for example, right? And they can't change their, they can't change their decision making 
every single day or it would be complete chaos. But that's because of their role, because their, their, their job is to set the high level direction, whereas people who have a lower, what was the term for it? I'll pull it up, time span of discretion. Um, <laughs> the people who have a, a shorter time span of discretion, they need a shorter time span of discretion because they need to change, they, they gotta have a, they gotta change their decision making more often. Uh, it's a, that's a, uh, one way to look at it, absolutely. Um, they also need to be redirected more often. See, the, 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 the reason that, that the person at the, at the parallel processing stratum four role has got the longer time span of discretion is that they don't need to be redirected as quickly. So, but what, what, that, what happens is that they are gathering information from a lot of different sources, not just the one that you at a stratum two role are providing. And they're integrating all of that together and they're waiting on you for a particular piece of information that's gonna help them make their next decision. And then that decision's going to filter down to the stratum three and then to the stratum twos, because stratum three is gonna say, I need something new from stratum two. I need you to diagnose whether or not I should take this fork or that fork in my road. So give me this new diagnosis next. That's where uh, the, they are helping you, they're helping set your context, they're helping set your uh, uh, expectations for what you, you do next. Uh, and it's, it's coming from uh, the, 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 the larger context setters at the higher strata. Okay, so you, you at one point kind of mentioned uh, having a context model, which I don't think the stratums were a context. No, no, they're not. Right, and, and so, which I, I found intriguing because you know, I thought context myself and then written about it. And so I was sketching something out just in the notebook while you were talking. And it's probably not complete, but it would be nice at some point to have uh, a context model uh, in some kind of graphical form as an example. I realize context would be potentially different uh, you know, in the details. But your items here, but once you have that, your item here about uh, you know, does the context encompass the task at hand and does the boss's context encompass my own? I would probably change the word boss, by the way, to stakeholders because there can be multiple bosses and multiple people interested from a context standpoint. And in a perfect world, let's see if I have this right, in a perfect world, the context model uh, that the stakeholders, the boss has, would essentially exactly match, overlap my context, right? And it would encompass it, right, in a, in a way that was congruent. In a perfect world, though, I'm saying. Mm -hmm essentially equal each other. As we go into the real world, I think they're gonna start to diverge more and more. Yeah, sure. You know, to the point where when we get in trouble, if I was drawing it as kind of a Venn diagram, as the overlap right. gets smaller and smaller right. between, I'll call it the stakeholders, uh, contextual expectations, and mine or any employees, that's where we get a lot of problems. Right. Well, yes, exactly. And this is where, where, I, was, where I was saying that if, you're the, if what you bring to the table in terms of a context model is neither congruent with nor encompassed by those of the, the stakeholders. The reason I use boss, there's a couple reasons we can get back to it. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll stick with boss for now because that's what I've been thinking for the last few weeks. Um, uh, if you're not encompassed by that, you, you, you lose your sense of belonging, you lose your sense of safety, and you lose your sense of, of uh, uh, contribution to the larger scheme. You feel as though you're out of the scheme, and uh, so you, you lose your sense of value to the organization, um, and you begin questioning you know, what all's going on. And not that that's necessarily bad, because the organization could just be doing something wrong, but 
uh, it's not a comfortable place to be, and it's not nice. Um, the, the, uh, the idea that you've got uh, a, a boss or a bunch of stakeholders is that they are going to uh, basically end your time of discretion. <laughs> They're the ones who are going to say, okay, you've, you've had enough time, tell me what you think. That's why they're the boss, because they get to tell you what to do. So I, I like that. Uh, I would add into that with the concept of this context model. Your first question, where does context originate? I would probably even expand to that. Uh, originate and where does it unfold from? Because mm, nice. my experience with context yeah. is it, it, where you start at usually is not where you end up at. Uh, and yes, a, it is an evolving situation. things like yeah. plans and things like that, mm -hmm. where we get in trouble is sort of like with test procedures. If we just blindly follow the script, not good. The idea of it's really intriguing about the exploratory concept is you allow things to go in unexpected directions. Sure. Sure. As the context changes. So I would change the question, you know, originate and unfold or something like that. I, think that's an I like that. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had read about or seen uh, evidence of these stratum having transitive properties, meaning that if you're at stratum three, maybe you retain and apply some sort of characteristics from stratum two or one. Okay, may or I? If, or if these are very distinct, um, sort of orth orthogonal things. It's a great question. It would help me a lot if I knew who was talking so I could address you particularly. Okay, thank you. I couldn't see Justin. the lights. Okay. Um, I didn't even know that I needed to do that until it was just this disembodied voice, and so thank you. Uh, no, absolutely. We continually flip down and back up. Okay, uh, all the time. So, for instance, I mean, I'm I'm the tester at my company, right? And so I create the testing design. I create the the uh, what it is that we're going to test, how we're going to test it, what we're going to do, and then I got to go do it. And so I drill down. I say, okay, what do I have to do next? And that's the stratum three. And then I say, okay, how? What? What all evidence do I need to collect? And then I say, okay, what procedures do I have to follow to collect that evidence? And I drill all the way down. I perform my stratum one stuff, and I find out my stratum two conclusions. And then I make my stratum three decisions. And then I I decide uh, on my stratum four trade-offs on uh, which next goal to pursue. We all do that all the time. We all do that all the time. Yes, absolutely. The, the, the reason why uh, time span of discretion and a role is defined as the longest span of time on a task for which you have judgment and discretion is because you always have tons of little tasks. Uh, you kind of just answered a, a big part of my question, which is if you know, testing can function at the higher level stratum, because that's what you just described is exactly my experience where I work. So this is really, really useful because it tells me a lot about why I'm kind of, uh, not flailing, but you know, some of my own feelings of kind of being out of my depth a little bit, because um, I didn't realize that I was functioning or that I needed to function at stratum four, and I do. So I think that, that, that uh, that's gonna help. Um, and I guess my question now is like, how do I, how do I get there, and how do I figure out what I need from my boss who's doing the sort of company-wide strategy? Sure. Um, for me to do the, the testing yeah, the, strategy. Okay, excellent question. Uh, the, the the hard answer is you don't get there. <laughs> you grow into it. Um, there's, you can't take a pill and, and all of a sudden, whoa, I'm at stratum four. Uh, but you, you, you grow. The, um, Jack's mapped out uh, modes of growth through life. So people actually grow. Uh, they'll, they'll grow through stratum one and into stratum two, and that's about where they stay. Other people will grow through stratum one, stratum two, and into stratum three, and that's sort of where they stay. And other people grow one, 
two, three, and the stratum four, and that's sort of where they stay. Um, others uh, grow very quickly through all of them and are, are still accelerating as they leave the solar system. Um, and, uh, you know, the Stephen Hawking's and the, the Mozarts of the world. Um, it, it, working at a particular stratum in your particular environment is a function of your maximum capacity at the moment, which uh, I really strongly encourage you to uh, pick up the book Human Capability by uh, Elliot Jackson, Catherine Kaysen. I've, I've got a copy. I could show you the cover if you'd like to just come and, and, and get me later. Um, uh, where it describes the methodology that they use for determining whether or not someone is at, at which, you know, which stratum they're capable of operating in. Um, if, if you're capable of operating at stratum three at a high level, then great. You know, you're really, really, really doing uh, a great job and you just need to find someone to be your boss at stratum four. <laughs> if your actual boss is at stratum five, it, it, it's not surprising at all that you're flailing because you have this gap where the context which they're capable of providing for you encompasses way more than you're able to given your current abilities, your skill set, and your values and commitment to what it is that they're doing. It's just going to feel like being on the top of a mountain and all the wind is whistling by. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I would say that you need to find a real boss, a, a, someone to be intermediate. And that doesn't have to be someone at work. It can be a mentor that you find online, Anne-Marie Charrett or James Bach or uh, some people who do coaching can really be extremely helpful in here. Um, you can call Griffin anytime. Um, I'm sure he'll be really, really uh, uh, helpful to you. Um, but that's, that's where I would look for that. It sounds, just it sounds to me, I had a slide on my last year's presentation that I didn't include on this one that goes into the, what happens when you are uh, mismatched in your role and your boss is way too above you or, or below you or at the same level, none of which is where you want to be um, and the, the sort of uh, feelings that those bring up. But what you're describing, the flailing feeling is my context is, is not being um, uh, addressed properly. He's got bigger fish to fry than what I need, and I just I need someone to address what I need. Um, and so you, you can find help with that in our community. I, I agree that the uh, that a person who feels like they're flailing could consult with an expert and, and incre increase their skill level and then uh, become more satisfied because then they're more able to perform their work function. I guess I don't necessarily agree that that person's boss or employer is the person that is going to be able to provide that help because the person that they're, is their boss might not be an expert at what they do. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's, that's why you need to, to get a, a professional mentor outside of work. Uh, that's, that would be my, my suggestion um, to the young lady here. So earlier you had mentioned that um, you can traverse in reverse order the, the levels, the stress that you have been through before in order to accomplish your right. necessary goals. Um, but you also pointed at an example where, uh, say, a tester um, is not being utilized to his maximum capacity simply because there's a different value set at the leadership level and that, that person is underutilized, is not operating well. Is there fear or can there be regression where they you know, get uh, essentially capped and are no longer able to function and, and grow? That's a, an excellent question. Uh, outside of some sort of psychopathology, no. Um, it's, it's possible to get brain damage or something like that, but uh, uh, life presents so many challenges for us. Uh, the, this idea of, of uh, cognitive processing, you know, wh what, what sorts of processing we do is not stri strictly turned on at work. It's 
you know, you're, you watch the news, you, uh, you read a paper, you talk with your buddies, you know, you watch a football game. Um, whatever grabs your attention, you're going to process it at your, at your level because there's a very strong attraction to doing that. Um, there's also some attraction to uh, taking it easy and, you know, watching a rom-com or something like that. But um, red card. Yes, but you don't have to only be at work to process. Sorry, I thought your question was, was asking, is it possible that you're being capped by your corporate structure of your business? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, I was more worried about the idea of, <clears throat> sorry, I was more worried about the idea of uh, work specific and your career specifically and, and your capacity to grow in that uh, area. I see, life. I see, yes. And will atrophy being, you know, essentially being capped, will that type of atrophy cause you to just obviously look in other areas to grow and uh, right. no longer have the capacity to grow there. Yeah, it can, if that's the sort of person you are, but you're a person who came to cast. <laughs> and the people who come to this conference, not to say that other conferences don't have similar people, but by and large, the people here go and get what they want. You are not the kind of person that's going to sit there and, and remain capped. You're going to uh, keep keep hammering away, um, whether it means finding another boss or finding another job or creating your own job, um, uh, starting a company or something along those lines. You've got that capacity. You can do it. Um, it's uh, it is frustrating. It's disappointing to be in a situation where you can't express your full potential, um, uh, and that's a that's a, a, a crime upon humanity that is uh, per perpetrated by the mismanagement of corporations. Um, it's, a, it's really, really an awful thing, and it, it leads to a whole lot of suffering. Um, and, you know, you can, you can find ways out of it. I believe in you. Uh, so I'm curious about <laughs> movements like Agile and Lean, which seem to limit the time span of discretion to a very short amount of time, and whether you think, uh, just how does that fit into this model if basically you say the enterprise as a strategic decision is basically limiting its time span of discretion to three weeks? Yeah, it's an excellent question. The uh, uh, the basic idea of Agile and Lean is to uh, push the actual accomplishment of work down to a more procedural level. Um, the, uh, the, what happens over time is that the, the way that people approach a sprint is they don't actually say, this sprint is my life, and uh, once I get done with the sprint, I'm done. They say this sprint is a part of the cumulative functional uh, uh, set that is ultimately going to satisfy our needs and our goals. So it's a it's a it's a stratum two uh, method of of working with a stratum one day to day feel to it. Um, so everybody goes and does uh, a, a small amount, small-ish amount of work and wraps it up and then they move on to the next piece which accumulates some more evidence that we're ready to release. But it's not, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, a, a team-wide work on one bit, a team-wide work on the next bit, a team-wide work on the next bit. And um, uh, generally speaking, testing and code development are stratum two activities, so it's not necessarily um, limiting someone's thought process. They just have to remind themselves that this sprint is part of a bigger picture, and that's not hard. So your last question is a pretty good question. Beat on too much, uh, I think. And, and I actually, I read the question and attempt an answer 
I think there's several different ways to look at uh, the issue of, of team, even. Uh, because I've been involved in large groups where I was a manager and had testers working for me. And in those cases, you will have people in the team working at different stratums. And I think it's actually important to figure out kind of, you know, in the context, where's this person at? Make sure they understand the overall context. And then leverage whatever it is they can do at the stratum they're at. Right. Uh, and we don't necessarily always want everybody working uh, at three, four, five, or six. Uh, you can get good things out of somebody at stratum one or stratum two, I think. Well, abs absolutely, that's where, if, that's where all the work gets done. That's right, if you understand <laughs> all the rest is you know, where they're at and, and put them there uh, and you know, work with them. So I think that's important for people here to realize yeah. that, yeah, while a lot of us, as you say, in, you know, cast may be you know, the upper levels, an awful lot of us as testers, as people in teams are gonna have to figure out correctly how to deal with those lower level strategies. Uh, sure, other, okay. may, may I make sure. a point? The difference between stratum one operation and stratum two operation is vast. That's the sure. that's the the core feeling that we all feel this tension between the one school of doing the factory school stratum one stuff and the context driven exploratory testing stratum two stuff. That's the the dividing line there. And you can have uh, a range of capabilities within each stratum. And so what I hear you saying is that you can have people who operate at higher levels on different activities, and you can have them leading people who don't operate as high uh, at, at that activity. Go ahead. And, and you can also, you know, don't discount stratum one people. No, of course not. No, 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 no. There's a place for them because there's a large number of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they actually do the work, yes. Right. And, and the other thing, is there's a tendency, at least when I first read it and then thought about it a little bit more, the team is more than just the testers, potentially. Uh, particularly as we think of agile groups and things like that, or smaller groups uh, where I've worked, uh, I may be only the, the only tester there or two of us as testers. Then you have the thing where, uh, where I'm at schedule-wise, time-wise, gee, if I could get a developer to help me create a nifty little tool to you know, set up my data to read it in really fast. Right. Um, that's a programming task. Programmers love to program. You yeah, give them that your challenge, team. that's yeah. what they're going to you know, excel at. You put them doing testing, they're probably gonna drop down to stratum one. Exactly, so, exactly so, right, yes, and yeah, they'll hate so, it. So you want to figure <laughs> out, not just, I'll call it direct reports or test teams, but look at the broader team and go, you know, how can I, you know, leverage something, problem I have as a tester into a development uh, area or into, you know, even a management uh, area. Excellent point, excellent point. What can I do to, to draw that person's value system into, uh, into play so that their applied level rises? I, I've been known to give assignments to my boss and my boss's boss. And they, they took them a couple times to figure out I was doing it, but, that, that was their abilities. They were able to go do that. So I think that's an important question that people think about and not get just trapped in a yeah. you know, tester box. Thank you, John. My question is about, <clears throat> at some point you mentioned test, testing is dead and this change in business that you want to release more quickly than ever before. Is this related to pushing people to the stratum one? So you, you, you that management want us to act right now. Can you relate to this? It's a good question. I believe that uh, uh, the idea that, that uh, testing is dead has to do with um, moving away from making people operate at stratum one. That's the most generous interpretation of it that I can imagine. Uh, and basically to say the, uh, the, the, the 
concept of testing as a clerical activity is completely outdated. And uh, it, it really only makes sense to do it as a cumulative evaluative activity. And that's a, a, a different kind of thing, and maybe we won't call it testing anymore. Maybe we'll call it evaluative code development or something. Um, but uh, uh, again, what I believe is, is happening is that there's not a concern or a value within the, that, uh, the, that particular argument for uh, skilled testing, the, the, the idea that a, that a tester can be just as skilled as a doctor or a lawyer uh, and have just as much responsibility um, it just doesn't, doesn't seem to resonate in that camp. And uh, so the idea also that, that anyone would want to work at a clerical level is anathema to them. So they would say, okay, I wouldn't be interested in that. No one's interested in that. Let's take testing and turn it into a development activity. Um, I, it seems as though they're, 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 they're trying to relieve people from the burden of testing as though that's all they can imagine testing is, is a burden. Uh, and, you know, if, if your idea of, a, of someone working at Stratum One is a, someone who's, who's got to be miserable and got to be really uncomfortable, well, I think that that's a fairly small-minded way to think. But also, if you want to think of, of testing strictly as a clerical or a, uh, a, a, a procedural activity, I think that's a fairly small way to think, too. Did I answer your question at all? Eh, okay, we can talk later if you need to. <laughs> so, so, some interesting um, factual uh, history that uh, very few people know about the whole testing bed thing. Um, part one is, Savoy's talk was thought up first, not Whitaker's. Whitaker stole the title from Savoy after he submitted it to GPAC. Savoya's message was test is dead, ripping off the Nietzsche quote from whatever that was, that God is dead, which didn't mean there is no more God. It was a statement of change. The way that we currently think of it no longer makes sense. So the original reference was not to say testers go away. We're, we shouldn't test. The original message was the predominant theory or the predominant activity, and look, we're a cat. We're not the predominant theory, okay? Out in the, the companies who don't know the cast exists, which is the majority, right? The way that they're doing testing needs to change to keep up. That was the message. Yes, he did it in a very bitey way, and he got the attention. Unfortunately, for Savoy's message, Whitaker did his talk first, which was also very bitey and very interesting, and actually had some points that I don't disagree with. His conclusion, some of them I disagree with. Regardless, two completely different messages that, if you followed since, have gotten blended into one big glom of argument where people have interpreted the titles of the talk as, go away, testers. We don't need you looking at our software. That was never the intent. Oh, good. Oh, yes. Everyone is required to consider. Everyone's required to consider. Can you turn it on? Uh, please uh, consider submitting a lightning talk. Um, it's outside here, Paul will help you uh, figure out what you should probably talk about. He volunteered to do this. <laughs> and actually, go ahead. You said you would. Yeah, Chris, do a lightning talk. I possibly will. Uh, I wanted to ask one question, though. So, Jordy, what question should we have asked you that you that we didn't ask you at this time? All right, Jerry. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> When's dinner? Good <laughs> 